Hello and welcome to episode 61 of The Garden Log. I am Ben Dark and I am a gardener and this is my podcast. It is all about the goings on above and just below the soil. This week I am talking about horticultural spires, delphiniums and lupins and foxgloves and how those plants are now giving up having done their work in the garden already. I'm talking about ironwork and its capacity to, to look beautiful and to puncture human skin. And I'm talking about bracken and stinging nettles and the pleasures of setting about them with a strong yet flexible stick. There's also a brief reading about Senecio and a roundup of things that you might like to do if you are listening to this from a similar late June sticky midsummer kind of place. Anyway, enough of the introduction. Let's get on and listen to the week in gardening. A very warm welcome to the week in gardening. This was a week that began hot, wet and humid. Cycling through Dulwich at six in the morning, it felt tropical. It felt like the kind of day where anyone sensible would get all of their minor tasks and chores done in the light of dawn and then spend the rest of the day sitting on a plastic chair underneath a spreading tree, perhaps a mango tree playing a little bit of dominoes or maybe some backgammon and chatting with other neighbourhood salts. Unfortunately, we do not live that life in London. We live a life of frenetic activity, of money-making and rush. And so I rushed on through the boroughs of South London and out to Marylebone, where I got on a train and joined my garden. And once I was in the garden, I spent some time snipping and pulling I was snipping the spent spires of lupins and delphiniums. And lupins and delphiniums are very communicative plants. They let you know when they're finished. You get a big strong shout, they do their flowering, and they begin to set their seeds, and then they just let everything below them go completely to rack and ruin. The leaves fall apart, they slump and turn yellow and collapse onto their neighbours, and you really have to, to do something about that. So I was I was snipping those off right at the base, trimming back to a little rosette of leaves. I don't really care about that rosette, it'll, it'll come back next year. For now, I just needed to get some, some of the scruff out of the way. The other scruff that I was dealing with were, were the spent foxgloves, another of the, the spire-forming plants of the garden. And these ones do the same trick. They've done their job. They did their early summer, late spring piece of spectacular architectural garden joy. And now they're doing some seeds and their leaves can just go to the devil. And so what I did there was I took most of them out. I took them out completely because the leaves turn into into rusty clumps of of disappointment, really. And they're, they're not going to come back next year because they're biennials. I left some of the very best, the ones that had the best colour, the most vigorous plants, the least disease affected, to, to set their seeds, those tiny little seeds that will, will go everywhere in the garden. And hopefully by, by this process, we, we create a stronger population over the years. I'm sure some miserable disease-ridden specimens will, will blow in from, from neighbouring less well-attended gardens and, and ruin it all, but, but we can but hope. And that was Monday, really, a day of, of bog-standard maintenance gardening. I quite enjoyed it. You get to see all of the borders and trundle around and do that, that very exciting Tai Chi manoeuvre where you try and drag your body slowly through a full herbaceous border without crushing anything, and you end up giving a, a salute to the sun and a salute to the blackbird and a, raising your, your bottom to the to the other gardeners. It's it's an art form. On Tuesday, I, I woke up with trepidation. The street had thrummed with rain all night. It did not stop. 
it seemed almost as if the rain was falling in a in a block and you heard the poor roof tiles and the pavements and the garden taking a real beating. When I got up, it was about 5.30 and the rain was just easing off and I went out into this world of wetness. Every plant was bent and bowed by the weight and the slugs and snails had come out emboldened to climb to new heights. I think because the air was, was as wet as their mucus, they went to places they never would have dared to go before. I found one that had climbed really high on my bronze fennel and it was rasping away at the front of the the stalks, taking all the skin off, like when you bash your shin against a particularly ill-placed coffee table, which is completely new behaviour. It's quite exciting to see, but worrying. And at work, I did some work on the bracken, and I'm, I'm doing a bit of manual bracken keeping clear. This is just keeping a small clearing clear by breaking off the fronds as they come back. You will have heard about this on previous episodes of The Garden Log. And I've got a new technique. I was stamping. And now I'm using a switch. And by switch, I mean a, a thin bamboo cane. There's nothing like it for, for decapitating these young thrones because you whip it really fast and it makes the most glorious noise that tells you you're doing something. The swoosh down sound of a pole cleaving apart the air mass. And also it does no damage if you hit something more sturdy. If you accidentally overswing and get the, the base of a birch tree, then you haven't skinned it, you haven't barked it like you might do if you were using a strimmer or something slightly more slightly more petra driven. Swishing through bracken probably takes me back to my earliest days of gardening. I think that there is a there is a slight obsession within the gardening world, particularly in the world of garden media and garden podcasting in particular, with the, the genesis of people's gardening obsessions. People like to talk about when that seed germinated within their tiny mind. And no one's ever asked me, so I've never answered where my gardening memories first came from. But I think that I, I started with an interest in, in destruction more than nurturing. So I didn't have any any plants smuggled into my toy box and I didn't ask to spend my pocket money on seed catalogues but I did grow up next to a patch of wasteland bordered by a railway track and the wasteland was used by a farmer who used it only to dump his broken agricultural machinery in and this obviously made it the the world's greatest playground because every every moment in this in this patch of land was like the opening credits of of casualty or some video they might show you in school to to explain why the old man in the pub only has one arm and so so you could go off in here and be guaranteed to get into scrapes and those scrapes would be guaranteed to to harbor tetanus and all sorts of other horrible things and except when the farmer would dump the corpse of his his latest tractor into the into the place, no one ever went there except uh, except me and my brother and my sister, and our and our friends. And we would hold this great session each year called the nettle whacking session, and that would be all about carving paths through this wilderness with with sticks and switches and other whipping things. I particularly like to use the nylon tube that you would use to stiffen a kite that really could get a good flick on it, take out an eye and cut through a few stinging nettles. It was a very satisfying thing to do as a child. I think it's the same satisfaction that you get now when you when you see the path you have made through your wildflower meadow. But of course you've used stinging nettles instead of grass and there are rusting combine harvesters in the place of the oxide daisies. Anyway, that's my first experience of shaping the landscape around me. And that's what I got up to on on Tuesday morning. I also cut some hedges. In fact, I spent the vast majority of the day cutting hedges. But there's a less evocative story behind my my like or dislike of cutting hedges. So I won't go into that. On Wednesday, I did some wrestling with some ironwork. We had this special rhomboid arch commissioned. And a rhomboid arch sounds like an oxymoron because arch is a shape in itself. What it actually means was that the top sections of the arch, if you think of an ironwork arch with hoops 
and then bars joining them. They form from the very top, they would form squares looking down on them like you were a like you were a thrush flying over the top. You would see squares. But this one is slanted, so you would see you would see little rhombuses. It is an arch on the wonk. And we, we took delivery of this huge great thing, assembled it on its back with its legs in the air, righted it like like the inhabitants of, of Easter Island erecting one of their great gods and march it into place. And uh, it was it was very hard work and we had to whack it down with sledgehammers and I ripped a, a big hole, a crescent shaped hole in the exact geographical centre of my palm, which made me look like I had been slightly one quarter crucified and it was very painful actually. And then, and then after that, we washed down the paths because there was mud everywhere. And I took a great risk in cutting back this vast bed of mint. We've got this huge, huge, great bed of mint. It's only allowed for mint because nothing else could get in there. Mint forms such a dense mat of roots and runners looking for extra space to colonise that no other plant would have a chance. Occasionally an acorn that has been buried by a squirrel thrusts its way up using that, that stored energy but, but that would quickly get swamped. The whole thing was looking, looking rusty around the bottom and, and leggy and starting to fall over and so I cut it right back down to just a few nodes above the ground. And this is a horrible, horrible risk because we are entering the, the mojito season and I have severely limited the garden supply of mojitos now. It's midsummer, people will want minty drinks, even might want some mint on their potato salad. That's something I remember that I haven't had for a long time. So just me, they had mint on potato salads as a child. Anyway, they might want that. And, um, and now there is no mint there. There are only other mints in, in pots and, and other sections of, of vegetable gardening that are further away from, from Mojito Muddling Station. So I'm hoping that they, they come back very quickly. I'm hoping within two weeks the, the nodes will have budded, shot, and have their first very, very fresh, very exciting and flavoursome leaves out. That's the thing about mint. The reason you're supposed to, to cut it back after flowering is that the chemical makeup changes. It's the same thing that those lupins and delphiniums and foxgloves were going through. The plant has done its job for the year. It has flowered. It is setting its seed. It doesn't really matter if, if people come and eat the leaves and bugs get into them. So all of those quite biologically expensive processes of making the pungent essential oils can, can be eased off a little bit. And and after flowered mint is just not the same. This is essentially the, the Chelsea chop for mint to keep it in a young, fresh, juvenile plant way. Uh, fingers crossed that it, it works. As ever, I will keep you posted on that. Once that was done, I went home and cooked myself some dinner and I managed to wedge a crystal of rock salt right under the flap of torn skin on my palm, which was a new and extremely painful experience. On Thursday I, I took a day to recover and on Friday I was back to it with some some trimming, some long beech limbs that had got in the way were, were taken off and sent through the chipper. It was quite fun. I really like the smell of, of beech leaves going through a chipper. It smells like like vegetable which essentially it is, I suppose, all of those cells popping and releasing nice little little aromas, very fresh and green. And if you if you put a a stem of fresh beech about the thickness of a decent cucumber through a chipper, it does something very strange. It flakes along the grain as it cuts, so it comes away looking exactly like like a can of tuna that has been upended onto a plate. You know how a can of tuna, if you tipped it out, you could pull it apart with a fork and it would come away in those little sections, almost little squares all the way through it. Beach does the same thing. Well, who knew? After that, I planted some cycads for a bit of texture. You know cycads, they're those very, very Jurassic looking plants. They have a big growing point in the, in the center. And they go away from that like a, like a very rigid, inverted cone, almost like a, a shuttlecock placed upside down in the border. And because of this, they, they can be quite tricky to work with. Because they splay out so in such a rigid manner, they can almost make a hole in the garden. 
they stop things coming into that space, things that might normally flop and intermingle, and suddenly you have just this this dent in the garden. So you have to watch out for this impenetrable barrier to, to floppy things that they can they can form. I think they look better with with upright, rigid things next to them, with, with spikes next to them, or next to a path where where half of them can go back into the border and half can come slightly out over the stone. Or by the rock they look really good. There's a dentist surgery near me somewhere that has the most fantastic planting of, of cycads. It might be a GP surgery. I don't know. Anyway, they're they're a good urban path side plant if anyone's into that kind of thing. They're also extremely, extremely ancient. They're one of these things that we can find in, in the fossil record causing causing a pain to all of those garden designers of the, the Pliocene era. That was it. Those bits of planting were the last acts of a man ready to go home for the beginning of a very hot and well-earned weekend. It was a very enjoyable week in the garden. It's really in flow now. I think with the heat that we're scheduled for as well, things are going to start racing along a little bit better. The, the the plants that need sustained heat, the dahlias and the bananas, seem to be biding their time a little bit more. They're flowering, the dahlias. They're flowering well, particularly the ones that went in the greenhouse. But they are doing so at the expense of height. The height that they had last year, they're probably a foot below it. And I think that's because they haven't had consistent warmth. They haven't had those nights that stay above 15 Celsius and merge into a day above 15 Celsius. And I think that that's what we've got coming up. So I'm hoping that that will really give a little bit of oomph to some of the, the tropical sections of the garden and get some, some leaf production in overdrive. If you're very interested in this, then of course the, the place to find out about it is in episode 62 of The Garden Log, which you will find here at the same time next week. Until then, let's see if I have any recommendations this week. Just one recommendation this week, and I am afraid it is from me, as if you had not heard enough of me. This is a little project that I have been doing recently. It's mainly a a bit of fun, but I'm hoping to do something with it at some point in the future. I've been writing little 500 word essays about plants, not plants that have any particular meaning to me, just about plants that I come across in the gardening life. And I'm doing one of these every couple of days, and I think when I've got about 30 of them, I might start putting them out as a little plant for the day. We're only at at number five or six at the moment, so we're quite a long way off. But anyway, I thought I'd, I thought I'd read one to you to, to give you a sense of, of what I'm doing at the moment. This is about silver ragwort, which most people probably know as Senechio. It's the Senechio cinearia, that silver leaf plant that many people will be familiar with. And the reason I'm reading you this one is because it, it relates to last weekend. I wrote it on Sunday morning after experiencing the, the events described within. So I hope you enjoy this. It's been nice for me to, to do something that is slightly more scripted. These podcasts I tend to improvise from a, a little sheath of notes. But this is actually following on sentence by sentence in a way that's fairly new. So here we go. Silver ragwort. Americans know Jacobea maritima, which was once Senechio cinearia, as Dusty Miller, because it looks dusted with flour. It is a Mediterranean sub-shrub, but is here grown as an annual, used by our parks and crematoriums as a silver leaf trim around their floral carpets. Many years ago, I had a job planting it in etiolated S-shapes along a dodgy Uzbek billionaire's driveway. On wet days, the trees would merge the rain and splash the plants below. Jacobea maritima's colour comes from its fuzz, and fuzz holds onto mud. By September, they all had clean heads and dirty brown legs, and quite honestly looked revolting. 
not that anyone seemed to notice or to care. For a long time I believed that if there was one thing worse than silver ragwort in bedding, it was silver ragwort at two or three years old. It is described as half hardy, but an English winter will never prove fatal, leaving it to sprawl about producing yellow flowers that clash with its own leaves. It is frequently used to fill some chink of soil next to a path or at the top of a rockery. The unusual colour and plug plant-sized retail pack trick unwary gardeners into popping it near the alpines, but Jacobea Maritimer did not evolve to flower low and bright in the wake of the snow. It evolved to slump over Grecian hillsides and survive goat attack. It looks like it as well. With an Aegean blue backdrop, it is perfect. With six varieties of heather, it is an abomination. So it came as a surprise that one midsummer's evening I saw a bed planted with silver ragwort that almost stopped me in my tracks. I was hungry and kept cycling, but I resolved to return. The next day I came back to Regent's Park. It was the first day of warmth in a cold and unpredictable June. People were enjoying the park, and a woman had taken it upon herself to spoil it for them. She had set up a music stand in front of three Korean teenagers, and was very, very slowly playing O Solo Mio on the flute. The noise was horrible, but the planting sublime. There were no reds, oranges or yellows, just the fresh glaucous leaves of coppiced eucalyptus, dusty pink gaura, the clean green paddles of some as yet unblooming nicotiana, and a pale leafed and pastel flowered pelagonium. The star and accent plant was stately, silver and glorious. It was the ragwort, but upright and proud. There were second-year plants, but staked up with bamboo canes. It did not matter that they had muddy skirts, as the surrounding planting hid their sins. Here the matrix of Jacobea did not shout. It looked calming and bizarrely classy, as the theme to Game of Thrones haltingly tootled from beneath the limes. I left the park, happy to have had my horticultural horizons expanded. So there you go, a small essay about a plant that not many people write about, about Senecchio, or as it's now known, Jacobea. It was it was very fun to write, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. I do hope that you enjoy your time in the garden as well this week, as that is it from me. I won't see you again until episode 62, when I will be back here telling you all about the progress of the mint, and whether or not those dahlias put on any growth. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful time, whether you manage to get out into the garden or not. I thank you very much for listening. I have been Ben Dark. This has been The Garden Log. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.